Okay, good, good, good morning guys, how are we? Uh, again, I don't know who's on the call, okay, so we're going to be doing physics today. Um, you know, my principal, Julie Martin, she and I sat down and, uh, a few weeks ago and said it might be a nice idea to give, I don't know, a primer or a reintroduction to different subjects I teach or future. Okay, so just give me a couple of moments and we'll start. And what I'm going to do this morning, uh, I know some of you might be joining us who are about to start university as well, University of Limerick or Trinity, etc., to do theoretical physics and applied physics. But what I want to start is kind of like, you, you haven't been in school since March 12th. Okay? Now, I know some of your teachers have been very good in the sense that they've, you've had a remote learning, etc., and remote learning is, I must admit, quite difficult. Like I'm standing in this room, it's like an RTE studio, but I'm by myself. And most teachers I speak to say, Barry, it's, um, it, gets, it gets a bit um, lonely, so to speak, because the students aren't there to make fun of me. So what I'm going to be doing today is I'll be, I'll just overview the exam paper, okay? And then on our website, where you linked in here, right, there should be a PDF. But I'll be moving between my iPad and the board, okay? Right, so we'll get going in a couple of moments. And uh, welcome, by the way, as well. And uh, I suppose, just, just so you know, I'm going to teach to a H1 level. Not everybody wants a H1 necessarily, but um, that's the way I kind of teach. Right? Okay. And uh, we'll discuss that in a couple of months. Let me just get my computer set up. Two iPads with me and an iPhone. So we go for an hour and a half, and I won't uh, bore you beyond an hour and a half, okay? Because as my nine-year-old mother says, when I, when, when I started, uh, you know, when I met Julie Camarton through my solicitor and um, Julie asked me to do a bit of um, uh, tutoring, uh, I remember my mom saying, I remember I did a full day in, the uh, first time I did a full day of physics, it was around October time, I said with my mom, she's about this high, very grand, to be two shoes, etc., nine years of age thin because she likes her figure, she doesn't like to put on weight. And she said to me, so Barry, when you do an hour and a half, when you do a full day of um, physics, do you, um, do, do the kids come to you for an hour and then go to another teacher? I said, no, it's, it's with, they, they stay in the same room with me, they have breaks and uh, we do physics all day. And she goes, whatever about listening to you for an hour, but all day, <laughs> right, okay. Now I hope you've had a good summer, okay. Now, I find students come back to me and say, this is very valuable. Now, some of you might be going on, on to university already. Okay. So physics for me is, I don't know, probably a bit nerdy of me to say, but uh, it's probably the greatest, I don't know, one of the greatest.
rich achievements of our species, okay? So, students say to me, post exams, etc., and when they're at university and come to me, the exam structure, I constantly go over exam structure. Okay? And why? Because you need a game plan. Right? We have to have a game plan. So what's the structure of the exam? Well, you've got section A and section B. I'm not going to spend much time on this. I'd prefer to do questions, okay? But I want to give you just a background of the exam and what you need to kind of consider when you're trying to do well in this exam. Section A is quite easy. So the overall exam is 400 marks. And by the way, just before we get started, some of you probably know me already, my arithmetic is terrible. My algebra is very good, but my arithmetic is terrible. Color here. Okay. Section A, there are four questions and you have to answer three. So four questions, answer three to answer. Okay. That's your mandatory experiment. They look very, very ghastly, but they're not that bad. Question one is always mechanics. Now, I'm not going to be doing those today, but I'll be doing mechanics today. Question four is always electricity. Right. And then between those two, between those two guys, right, will be optics, but we don't know heat, optics light, heat and sound. Okay. So whatever you do, you must answer question one out of four. But the only problem is they're only 40 marks each. Okay. So it's 120 marks. So it's not, it's a... Uh, but, but it's in your gift, isn't it, to actually do well on those. Okay. But we're, we're bookended by mechanics and electricity. So those mandatory experiments you have to know. So you have to answer those questions. Probably the hardest one here might be uh, Joule's Law, which may, somebody be, I know you finished school on March 12th, so it's hard to know, because I, I don't know the, the constitution of the student body uh, listening into this today. But you can see that you're guaranteed for the last 40 years, give or take, those mechanics and electricity. So that's two out of three. Okay. What about section B? Section B, and this is my advice to students, because I was very, very lazy as a kid. I'm still that lazy as an adult, which is least effort for maximum gain. Okay. So that's one to four. Okay. And then we start with question five, six, seven, eight, 9, 10, 11, and 12. Make sure that that can be seen on the board. Yes, you can. Question 5 is where you have to answer 8 out of 10. Okay? So that's kind of the basics of the physics course. I love that problem. And what you have to do in section B is you have to answer 5 out of 8 questions. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Yeah, you have to answer 5 out of 8. That's quite nice, actually. Okay. The economics is even better, because in section B of the economics, at least historically, you only have to answer four out of eight. I like that. I like this question five. So what do I do with the students who come to me in sixth year and fifth year? Is It sounds, it sounds like it's an awful lot of work, but we just basically do 30 years of question fives, and they tend to be very repetitive. So that's one out of five, in my point. What I'm going to be focusing on today, now, question six, historically, has always been mechanics. Given I did my PhD in the US many moons ago, we call that classical mechanics. So in the sense of not, no relativity and no, um, no relativity and no quantum mechanics. I've had students, for instance, come to me from Glenn Stahl over the years very good at maths, very good at physics. And they say, and then kids would come, come, come from Tralee to do physics with me. Ah, and, and they do apply maths as well, but they say, Barry, that, that question would be very long. But that's what I'm going to be focusing on today. Okay? So from my point of view, when I was your age, I'd go, OK, I've got my mechanics and my electricity. Guaranteed a question of those. <clears throat> I'd be more skeptical about the ones in, in black ink here. You know, optics, light, heat, and sound, because I'd go, you know, I, I, you know, um, 
I'm semi retired, so. But one of the students told me about quite a while ago that I think on your English exam, higher, higher English for the Leaving Cert, you have six poets and six poems per poet. So that's 36 poems. But if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, or I could, you can't because we can't communicate on this free class. But that would really kind of annoy me <laughs> because I go, I've got to learn 36 poems and then I'm only examined on two of them, right? That's what I wouldn't have liked about the uh, stuff in Black Ink here. would be the fact that I'm not going to be rewarded for learning all stuff. Okay. So now, what is question seven usually? Now it becomes slightly, slightly harder to predict the exam structure. Okay. So here, question seven is usually waves of some form. And that will be light. And the way I kind of, like, my, my um, analysis is, if just say you were asked a question on the diffraction grating experiment, then question seven would be sound. If in section A you're asked a question on sound, then question seven here will be light diffraction grating. And again, what I do is make kids do, uh, if they're up to it, uh, do 30 years of exam questions. See, from my point of view, I kind of ignore section A until later on in the year. It's like learning off your, I think it's King Lear this year, isn't it? It's like learning off your Shakespeare quotes. That's 60%, isn't it? Of the exam. <laughs> of section B. Now, I'm going to jump to question 12 now. Question 12 tends to be, you have to answer two out of four choices, A, B, C, or D. I'm not going to go into great detail, but A is usually mechanics. So, approximately two, if not three out of those ten questions will be mechanics. Then you get question six, and then question twelve, half the question will be mechanics. It has to be, okay? So that's four, isn't it? So that's 80%. <laughs> appealing to my laziness. <laughs> right, okay, appealing to my laziness. Now, it's hard then between here and here to know what goes on, but there has to be, there has to be a question on atomic physics. You might call it modern physics. And the great thing there is, see, we don't have the maths for it. Because the maths, you need partial differential equations, you need these Schrodinger's equation, etc. So they tend to be stylized facts. So at least one, if not two, here, between question seven and twelve, will be what I call modern physics. And then you have this elective, don't you? You can choose to do further electricity, or you can do particle physics. Don't, don't, that sounds very grandiose, but actually the particle physics is, is the... It, the particle physics compared to question six is kind of completely trivial. That's your exam. That's why I teach. So, the year before last, uh, I used to teach, uh, uh, Julie asked me to teach uh, physics on a Saturday morning in Ennis. Right, okay. So, I do applied maths and economics on a Friday evening. Stay in Ennis, it's a lovely town. Actually, a very, very pretty town. And then I'd um, I'd teach uh, maths in the morning and then physics afterwards, and then the rest of the day, the H part and things like that. And this one young kid, a really, really nice young man, right? And uh, I remember when the Leaving Cert results came out in 2019, and his mother called me, again, a lovely woman, and he wanted to do engineering. And uh, the kid got a H3. Now, I thought he could have done better than that. So H3 is, what, 70 to 80%, which is quite, quite remarkable. So the mother said, uh, I'll put my son on the phone with you, okay? So I was speaking to the son. And I said, gosh, you must have, you know, the H3 is excellent because it's a hard exam, okay? It's a very hard exam. There's an awful lot of information. <laughs> this, uh, and uh, this young lad said to me, um, <clears throat> I said, how did you get a H3? Well done, you know. Uh, he said, Barry, I did no work other than your Saturday morning class in Ennis. I said, what? What do you mean? He did no independent study. He said, no, came to your class for an hour on, on Saturday mornings. And he said, because he did so many exam questions, he says, I'm surprised by the H3. 
I said, I can't, obviously I can't say a name. I said, but, but you did no independent study at all, other than attending my class, and, and he did come to my um, uh, uh, Easter courses, especially on the mandatory experiments. Like Julie, a number of months ago, asked me to redesign the um, <clears throat> our day-long courses in physics. And one course, which is very popular, is coming up to the exams, <clears throat> I cover every single experiment. And I've got quite good notes. I, I think they're quite good notes, in the sense of, I write notes where I go, would that have been useful for me at your age? Rather than notes that I would like at my age. Does that make sense? So he got a H3, and he said he never did anything. He said, Barry, because you did something every Saturday morning, which is quite interesting, but you, all you did was exam questions over and over again. I love physics. I love mathematics. Um, but what we have to be clear about is the fact that we also need to get the grades, don't we? Okay. So that's your exam. So from my point of view, if you're trying to be, and I don't say this to your parents because they'll probably think that I'm a bad teacher to say this, all I need to know is these three, be able to attempt question 12, and know my atomic physics. You have to know the magnetism, electricity, but not necessarily totally in depth, if that makes sense. And then um, H3 or H2. Now, how are the, in section B, how are the exam questions structured? Okay, structured exam questions. See, I'm just I'm very, very ruthless about this. It's kind of like, why, why waste our time? I said to one student, uh, she was brilliant in physics, and I said, um, she said, Barry, do you always love physics? And I said, no, not when I was at UCD and then at Caltech. You know, Caltech is the, I did my PhD at um, many months ago, obviously at the same school, the same university that uh, the Big Bang Theory is set in, you know, so my American friends call me Sheldon. So, so, but, I just, but I hated physics the day before an exam. But then I had all summer to enjoy the physics if I so wished. Okay. Structure of section B questions. Now here is where it gets a bit like the economics. Okay. Not like the maths, but a bit like the economics. See, the applied maths I prefer because the applied maths is solve the problem, move on. Right? Here, there's a slightly different thing. So each question in section B will carry 56 marks. Okay. And that makes up 280. I think it's 5 by 56. Okay. And here is where the physics becomes a bit different. Uh, what I find is, what I divide, when I, you know, when kids come to my classes over the years, what I find is, some of them like learning off stuff. So in other words, book work. And anybody who does biology probably realizes it's a lot of book work in biology. You know? And then there's problem solving. Okay. Very, very important. And if anybody's going to be well, or Trinity, next few months, and good luck to you guys if you're tuning in. Uh, that's about, out of 56, that's about 24. I know my, my arithmetic is terrible. So it's about 20, 20, about 26. So students have, to, you know, so when I was your age, what did I like? I liked the problem solving. I wasn't too keen on the learning off. But they're very pedantic about it. Okay. But you see, you can actually do quite well on learning all stuff. The good thing is, as you see with my notes as we progress, hopefully in sixth year or fifth year, is the learning all stuff is quite repetitive. So it sounds like they can randomly throw things at you, you know, but in fact, actually, if we look at 40 years of papers right, over the next 12 months, Nine months, that's it. Um, this learning off, we just get good at it. Okay. The problem solving is an issue. So I'm going to be focusing on the problem solving today with mechanics. Okay. Uh, one of my students said to me, she, used, she, uh, she, a couple of years ago, she ended up doing medical physics at Trinity and um, she was finding the course in first year a hard time. I think she probably spent too much time in the coffee shop. But she got a H1 in physics. 
So she'd come to me um, to kind of study the medical physics. You know, she said, Barry, you know, is it possible to give tutorials on the medical physics? And I said, sure, but, you know. And she said to me, um, you know, Barry, no offense, but what you wrote on the board here, I think, made a 10%, if not 15% difference to my exam. In other words, it's a plan, isn't it? It's a plan of attack. See, when I was your age, I could do... Uh, I had to get a H1 in maths. I had to get a H1 in, in physics and a H1 in applied maths because my dad is no longer with us. I think I bored him so much and he was more into hurling and fishing than I was more into the physics, right? So, so as a kid, and I probably bored him endlessly with talking about physics and quantum mechanics and uh, the electron and the spin of the electron and how could, um, how could an electron, which has no dimensions as far as we can see, have a spin, you know? And uh, so I, I was going kind to of paint myself into a corner, guys, and I went, if I don't get H1s on these, uh, years later he'll go, ah, sure, no, my son wasn't, uh, and he was from Cavanmore, a brilliant hurler in his, in his day. And uh, I, I think I would have, um, if I didn't get H1s, I think in these three subjects, maths, applied maths and physics, I think he'd, years later he'd go, ah, sure, now Barry was good at the maths now. But no, he only got an H2. But it's good effort. Right? So I kind of take to myself into a corner. But, the, but here's the key, isn't it? Because see, when I was a kid, all I had to do was well on um, three subjects. Uh, if I got three H1s when I was a kid, and just say three H3s as an example, I'd still, if I wanted to do medicine, I would have been able to do medicine. But you guys are in a different boat. But it's about 61,000 people, students do the leaving cert every year, and there aren't enough places at the university. So now I'd have to be, I'd have to get H1s or H2s in the other three subjects. I had one student last year, and I think I've mentioned to anybody online who's kind of heard me lecture before, I had one student last year, a wonderful young man in applied maths, and he needed 607 points for quantitative finance at uh, UCD. So part of my job is to try and make, truncate the course. I can't make it easier in the sense that concepts are the concepts, but at least from an approach. Whereas you can't communicate with it at the moment. So what would I do if I was your age? And this applies to UL as well, by the way. So when, when UL students come to me or Trinity students come to me in physics or, or mechanical engineering or electrical engineering or engineering mathematics, all I say to them is send the previous exam papers. I've had students go from, it's, it's just exam technique rather than anything else. So if I was your age, definitely question five, which means you need to know the course quite well, right? Recently, this has become weird, the, the question six. I love the one in red here, and I love question 12, because I've got to only have to answer two out of four, okay? And there has to be an atomic physics question somewhere in here. And that would be my exam. But, but please bear in mind, though, there might be you know, parts of the course that you don't like so much or you don't have time to complete as much as you'd like to, but you need to know them, if that makes sense. Okay? Even if a full question came up in section B, you may say, no, I'm not going to answer it, but you need to know it for question 5 and question 12. Okay. Without further ado, I think that's worth... Um, honestly, guys, and, uh, I think that's worth... Uh, Enormous marks. Enormous amounts of marks. Because it's a plan, isn't it? And also, any of you start coming to me and then um, once we start back in school next week, you know, in our, our tutorials next week, uh, and some of you have already downloaded it, but, uh, and I'll show you in a moment. I'm very disorganized. I've got all these booklets that I use. See, so I like writing in you can buy them on matinees, and I, I don't like lines. When I was a kid, I hated, you know, those notepads with lines on them. I see the lines more than my own writing. But so everything's written, but I like the... It's, it's very French, actually, it's very French. So I like writing in these kind of like art books when I do maths or physics. But then when I, when I go, a student will send me a question, I go, oh, I've done that before. But then I, I kind of quickly realized, Barry, you need to be more organized. And so, a lot, of, especially my junior cert students, actually, I've helped them organize their, um, 
their iPad or their Android device. Okay. So why did I do that? Because it's worth an option. So I'll help you structure, if you come to my classes, <laughs> that sounds like I'm trying to sell a book or something. Um, if you come to my classes, let's make sure that we're, we're um, au fait with that. My glasses. Oh, I don't need my glasses. Old man. Uh -huh. Ah, there they are. Okay. Now I'm going to swap out now. I'm going to move from the whiteboard, and let's hope this works, to my iPad. I sent a PDF, it should be on the website. I've got a PDF on, um, it's called, just go back to the board for a second. It's going to be called energyquestions.pdf. Okay. In fact, actually, you know, energy questions, I put it in there. Yeah, energy questions. Now, on the free listing, remember, the reason why we're doing this course is this. Well, just, just as a kind of like a thank you to, um, to all the frontline workers, you know, not just the medical staff, but you know, even the Mr. Bin Man, you know. These poor people come into, when I say poor people, these, these individuals come into our apartment buildings or houses and pick up our garbage, don't they? And uh, they must be scared every day. Right up to the surgeons who are trying to help. So. Um, so we said Julie and I, well, Julie suggested it that maybe we give a few, I don't know, reintroductions to maths and physics, economics and applied maths. Okay. Okay. So let's, so if you have that, but it doesn't matter if you don't, okay? And honestly, the only way I think to teach physics or maths is to do exam questions. That's a particularly hard question. Let's look at this. This is an example of a of a question six. Right. Right. C for twelve marks it goes to find force and momentum. And I said earlier, so so basically we're getting twenty seven marks for, for uh, out of fifty six for book work. But then we go on for a problem. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm, I, because we've only got an hour and a half. I'm going to I'm going to try and do this stuff here, state news laws of motion, etc. But not spend too much time on it. Because that's what I what I tend to find with students if I can get them to learn that by themselves and get good at how the exam has to be answered, then they do quite well on it. But that's important. So I'm going to introduce again Newton's laws. But I'm not going to spend too much time on it, given our our time uh, on the screen. So, uh, it's very, very important, isn't it? Yeah. 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 You know, I actually, sometimes I think the physics course is very big. So I'm going to just kind of like, ah, oh, I'm going to focus on that. So I just found my Apple Pet. Okay. Now, again, I don't know if you guys can see this or not. Right? Okay. And I hope your broadband's working. And hence, establish a relationship force equals mass by acceleration. Okay. I'll spend a few moments on that. But I prefer to... Then, you see, that's 27 marks, isn't it? 12 plus 15. Right, so that's... I call it question three here because this is a PDF that I sent out last year to, to uh, kids who were interested in physics. But this is basically your question six. So the previous question was question five, basic concepts, and this is your question six. And then we have, remember I said, then we have, depends. Now, I would have preferred this. 
then we have a problem to solve. But see the way the exam is structured, where you can get 27 out of 56 by knowing your bookmark. Okay. Now I'll do this quite quickly, but I'll try and motivate it hopefully a bit better than maybe you recall. Because a lot of this stuff is introduced and you're only in fifth year. Right? So, and some of you have heard this before, so I apologize. It's a free class, but it's a free class. <laughs> What? So, so Isaac Newton right, sat down, we're told, would you believe, actually, it's, it's kind of weird, the, um, the plague, the bubonic plague had broken out in Cambridge, so he had to go home to Lincolnshire, to his, to his mother's farm, okay, and she had a, an apple orchard in the back garden, so he had to leave, that's what they did back then, that was social distancing, plague breaks out, everybody just go home. Not totally dissimilar to what we're going through at the moment. But by 1687, oh, by the way, if you read biographies of Isaac Newton, a very unpleasant individual, very unpleasant man, very unpleasant. So I think it was the 5th of June of 1687 that he published Principia, Principia. In it, he kind of stages his Newton's laws. Also, his understanding of the, what, what, the problem at the time wouldn't be dark energy or dark matter in physics. The problem at the time would be describing the orbits of the celestial bodies that we saw through our telescopes. Okay. But the guy who came before him, loads of them, would be Galileo. And also, Copernicus would have been a Polish Catholic monk, and Galileo was a, an Italian, again, arrogant. Copernicus was not arrogant, Galileo was. So, so Isaac Newton said, and these guys understood the concept of force, philosophy. So I'm not making a history lesson, but I'm saying there's a part of the course that actually does require this. Acceleration. They kind of understood these concepts. So it wasn't that Isaac Newton just invented them out of thin air. Okay. What did Newton say? So he, he had to escape Cambridge due to the plague. Went home to his mom's uh, house in Lincolnshire, in northern England. And a very, very pretty house, and they had an orchard in the back. And he noticed, so, so supposedly, he, he, he looked up at the moon. You know one of those days, it's mid-afternoon, where you can still, still see the moon, right? okay. depending on the orbits of the planets. And he looked at, the, at an apple. And an apple fell from the tree. And he goes, oh. so, supposedly, what he said was, the moon must be falling towards us every instant. Just like the apples what it was. He said, so the same inverted commas force is influencing both. Okay. So that was kind of like his, his initial reactions to the concept of um, gravity. We've since, we've since as a species understood that gravity is a little bit more to do with the geometry of space-time itself. But that's nice. And Newton knew that actually, by the way. He was, he was quite a clever chap. He knew that his theories they explained the reality he saw around him, but at the same time, he knew they were flawed. I didn't do the speed of light. So, what did Newton say? Just to answer this question, just going back here. To answer the first, to find force and momentum and state due to second law of motion, hence established the relationship force equals mass of acceleration. Okay. Right. So Newton said that he goes, okay. And I always use this, just say you're Rory McElroy. And I, see, I love physics, but, and I guarantee you can, like, you'll get the marks, okay, because I, I still remember the stuff that confused me. So 
Or Serena Williams, you know, brilliant tennis player. I just kind of absolutely when when Wimbledon's on over the years, Serena and Vanessa Williams just to see them playing tennis is just um, an extraordinary uh, privilege. Isn't it? So anyway, Rory McIlroy, I'll go, go over here. So Rory McIlroy takes his golf club and goes, this okay. So Newton would have understood, and Galileo and Copernicus would have known, that um, we're applying something called the force, aren't we? So I'm going to give that symbol F here. Okay. Now, you can't... Uh, <laughs> that sounds very harsh, because I am harsh. Now, <laughs> that sounds like... Now, let me tell you something else. So the force, from Newton's point of view, is something that we apply that changes the motion of an object. Okay? Now, it sounds very grandiose, but it's not. But it's better to do it, it's better just to think about it. But the golf club, Rory McIlroy, can only be in contact with the ball for a certain amount of time. I'm going to say, we're going to call this impulse. Now, maybe your teachers have told you, will know this in applied maths, because I, I cover it. So, force by the time, so, see, what in your textbooks, if there's always a tutor like me, pushing a, a crate from left to right, or right to left, right, with a continuous force. But that's not really the way the world works. I don't get up in the morning and start pushing crates. <laughs> I open the door to my bedroom, or I open the door to the kitchen. I quickly turn on the switch for the kettle to boil the water for my coffee. Right. I put the bread into the, into the toaster, and I click down the thing, and I go... So, the forces actually on day-to-day -day life are not continuous. So th this was Newton's great achievement. He said, if I apply a force, I don't know what it is, for a certain amount of time. So as, if, if you were in the classroom, I'd ask you, so when Rory McIlroy or Vanessa Williams, Serena Williams, hits a golf ball or a tennis ball respectively, the time the golf club is in contact with the golf ball is about, this is the 0.5 by 10 to the minus 3 seconds. That's all. Right. So, so the time, the instant before this, the, the um, golf club hits the golf ball, and the time the me immediately after the golf ball leaves contact with the golf club, means that the force no longer influences the change in motion of the object. And what our friend Isaac Newton said was, that must equal the change in momentum. Even if you're going to university, guys, this will be a question. Like at UL, if the students that come to me in first year and second year, this will be a question on, on your exam paper. The same in Trinity. So we'll just become more calculated. Uh, so that's Newton's second law. And again, because we don't have much time this morning, momentum, we usually give P, it's a vector, equals the mass of the object times the velocity. So the golf club was sitting on the T, I hit it, and I changed its momentum from zero to something else. Okay. Just the instant when the golf club, and that's Newton's second law. And that's the way, so in that question, that's what we're asking. And they get full marks. Again, they go, define force, momentum. That's a hard question when I was your age, like when I was 16 or whatever. And it's, you know, I'd look at that question and go, but you'll notice as we go through the sequence of lectures and tutorials is that if they ask this, they ask it the same way every time. Same for electrostatic, same for magnetism. So how would I define force? I'd use this. That's why it's what I'd start with is, and you'd have this ready to wheel out, you define Newton's second law. So Newton's second law says if I apply a force to an object of mass m right, for a time of t seconds, then I change its momentum. And that's Newton's second law. And we call that object here f by t momentum. And um, right. so I define that, and then I go force. Uh, even if you're going to university, it's the same thing. Is a vector. Right? It changes 
the momentum of an object. You have to mention it's a vector of an object it comes in contact with. Okay. And you see the way they ask you to state the second law. So what confused me is, and its unit is the Newton. But it's all kind of backwards. So Newton um, postulated that. Um, it could have been kind of more complicated than that, couldn't it? That's the way the world works. Now in your textbook, doesn't it say so proportional? Okay, so that's important as well. We use alpha to say proportional. Okay? And also your textbook will say force is proportional. The change in momentum, and I've got to use that Greek letter here, over the time the force is in contact with the object. I find that less intuitive than this. Because all I think about is Vanessa Williams. The, golf, the, the tennis ball is coming towards her and she goes woof. And the tennis ball is coming this way towards her and then it's going backwards the other way. So we have to be careful about this change in momentum. So it's a vector. Okay. Now what's a special case? Nick with this question is when the mass of the object, in other words, think about uh, Rory McIlroy hitting the golf ball. We can assume that beforehand, just before the golf club comes into contact with the golf ball sitting on the tee, right, and the instant after the golf ball leaves the top of the tip of the, um, of the golf club, the mass of the golf club, a golf ball, should I say, doesn't change. And the mass of the object in other words, like the golf ball, is the same before the force is applied. It's very hard. Not, not hard in the sense of just kind of like, how do we answer these questions? Before the force is applied and after the force is applied. I do apologize. See, what, what would be different there would be, and some of you came to my summer courses, is like if you were got a space shuttle or a, a, you know, or a, a space probe around Jupiter or something. In order to do, it's come from Earth, it's going at a huge speed. So it needs to go to orbit around Saturn, you'll say. So it's got fuel on board and starts ejecting that fuel to, in the direction that it's traveling. And the momentum conservation would say would slow down, and then it can actually enter into orbital, into an or orbit around the, the planet like, like Saturn. But there, the mass, before the force is applied and after the force is applied, the mass would change. So that's Newton's second law properly. Okay? But we have a situation now where I'm assuming, for this question, that the force doesn't change. And so what I say to students sometimes is, you know, you can get lucky and the exam goes your way, like any exam, but you can get unlucky. But at least, from this question's point of view, this is 27 marks, isn't it, out of 56? Right. And that's what they think I'm not now, is just trying to say to me, is that uh, he learned enough problem solving, and he learned how to answer these kind of questions uh, in the way that the examiner wants it, that he was able to get a H3. And as he said, he didn't know. Uh, a bright light, obviously, but he didn't know whether it worked. So he claims. So, I'm going to assume now, so going back to this question here, just to show it again on the board to you, on the, on the iPad, state Newton's second law of motion, that's what I wrote on the board on the right, and hence established a relationship force equals mass by acceleration. Okay. Wow. So, this is weird. And I didn't like this as a kid. So force by time is proportional to the change in momentum of the object, like the golf ball I hit. Okay. Now I'm not going to write on the board, but I could assume that the mass of the object before, for instance, for McElroy's um, uh, golf club, just the instant before it strikes the golf ball and the instant afterwards, the mass remains constant. Yeah. Okay. 
therefore force by... T now, momentum is defined as mass times velocity. So I'm going to say u is the velocity before, just using your... Um, and v is the velocity of the case. So let's see before. Just like your kinematics equations. And I'm sure all of you remember that, right? So force by time is proportional to the change in momentum. mv minus mu. Remember, v and u are going to be vectors. It's very, very important. That means force. Now I'm going to divide both sides by t. I prefer that kind of impulse concept here, force by time, because it, as a kid it didn't make sense to me unless I, I apply a force to something, but obviously it, it, to change its motion it also is, has to be a function of the amount of time the force is in contact with the object. So I'm going to divide by t the time the force is acting. So I get f is proportional to uh, is proportional to mv minus mu over t. So we're saying after, so v will be the velocity of the object once the force has stopped its action, and u is the velocity of the object before uh, I hit it. So f must be proportional to now, because the mass hasn't changed. What do we define acceleration to be? So we have three, vector-wise, we have a concept of displacement, okay, which is a vector. If you're in the classroom, it makes more sense, but if I walk five meters this way, that's displacing from my initial position. Come back to my initial If I walk five meters this way, I've walked five meters in both cases, but I've gone a different direction, so it's a vector. Right? And then, because it's not a calculus-based course, the rate of change of displacement we call velocity. And we call that v, let's say. And then v over t, the rate of change of velocity is acceleration. And for the course, we're not doing applied maths, for the course, acceleration is usually constant for the leaving cert. And acceleration is defined, and I'll show you in a moment, as the final velocity minus initial velocity over the time taken to get to that. So therefore, f is proportional to m times a. But you see, this is a special case in the second law because we're assuming that the mass of the particle is the same before the force is applied and after force is stopped supplying. So if f is proportional to m a, there must be a constant. So this is just a, a kind of a general reintroduction to your physics. So if, if something's linearly proportional to something else, there must be a constant like where f equals k times a. Yeah? And how do we define the Newton? All we do to make k equals 1. Right? So it's kind of circular, isn't it, lads? So, so what I say is, I define one Newton to be the force required. See the way it's circular, and you'll find this, and some of you who have been doing my summer courses, especially for university physics, realize you get the same thing, don't you, with the Ampere, and uh, the Tesla, and the Weber, etc. required to accelerate one kilogram by one meter per second squared. So therefore I can say k equals one. So I get f equals m a. Now I'm not saying this will come up necessarily, but I'm saying that's 27 out of 56, isn't it? Okay, 27 marks out of 56. I would hate that as a kid, right? Because I find it's just kind of like, it's like almost like going Bleh. <laughs> okay, so I would have disliked that intensely. But marks are marks, and that would have been 27 out of 56. So we have to develop in our course 
work is an ability to get those 27 out of 56. Now, 27 out of 56, let's call it, um, I know it's slightly greater than 50%, but just say it's 50%. And the next part of the question, if you can make a good stab at it, then you could get an extra, the remaining 50%, you could get 40, 50% of the marks. And that's, I think, how that young lad got a H3. Right? Okay? That's what they're looking for there. The other thing they'll ask on this will be conservation of momentum, which is very tricky, actually. My teachers, uh, I have very good teachers. I, I kind of remember them, you know, so long ago. But, I, but no offense to them, I, I just don't think, I don't think they fully realized what was going on. Because right? this is very subtle, right? This stuff is very subtle. Uh, but that makes sense, doesn't it? So that's but I, you know, not a bad reintroduction, is it? But remember all this displacement, velocity, acceleration, they're vectors. Momentum is mass times velocity. So, so Isaac Newton said there that if I apply a force for a certain amount of time, so if I multiply the force by the time the force is in contact with the object, then the change in motion of the object must be a function potentially of its initial velocity and its mass. So if I kick a, a tennis ball, you can't see I'm kicking a tennis ball, <laughs> uh, tennis ball's mass is quite small, but if I kick a cannonball with the same force for the same amount of time in contact with it, I'm probably not going to change its momentum that much. And I just happen to be lucky that nature is designed like this, at least on the level of macroscopic objects like cannonballs in terms of it. But, but hey, 27. Take it if you can. Okay. And that's how we make k equals 1. So in other words, f equals k times ma. We just make it equal k equals 1 by defining the Newton as the force I apply to an object of 1 kilogram to change its um, acceleration by 1 meter per second. And that's how you get this answer here. So that's a special case, okay? And I'm going to just, now I'm going to ask you, might as well jump in and answer the question here. This is a hard question. No, I don't think it's hard. I don't think it's that hard. It's just more, um, uh, if you can get to a point where you're able to set up the question, and I, I teach the H1 level, as I said earlier, but, but also I'm aware of the fact that not everybody loves physics, etc. So now, I'm going to give you a few minutes. Now look at this object here. Look at this question here. So we've established F equals MA, 27 marks. Look at this now. Hopefully you can see that on the screen. Yes, you can. So I'm going to give you a few minutes to think about that. And I'll shut up for a few moments, which is difficult for me.
Okay. So, so that I'd give you a break from listening to me. Now, here's an interesting thing. So before we can answer this question, let me just kind of overview your mechanics again. Even if you're going to university, it's the same thing. Everything is about energy, okay? Everything is about energy. What is energy? It's a weird concept. And it took our species enough long time to kind of like uh, begin to understand it. You know, I know you kind of like look at the textbooks and you say, all oh, these men and women, they're just old, dead, they're dust. But I was saying to some of my students over the summer, um, the, con the concept of conservation of energy was introduced by James Jewell. And would you believe he actually introduced that? It's actually the exam question. It started off with an exam question, which you can search a few years ago. It was 1841 in Cork, or Cove, I think, that he introduced the concept of uh, conservation of energy. It sounds like a long time ago, 1841. But uh, we think the universe is 14 billion years old. <laughs> That's 14,000 million. So as a species, we've only actually started to understand these concepts of energy and energy conservation in the last um, 170 years, which is quite... So we're a very young species, aren't we? It's energy. So, so I had tea and toast this morning. So I absorbed energy, probably too much energy. I'm probably not expending enough energy. So therefore, the, <laughs> the fat bee cheeks, <laughs> right? Okay, because <laughs> the energy's not been used, so it has to go somewhere. But, but we, what we define is energy and work, right? And I used to get very bored of this because the, the books were very linear, okay? We do this, we did Newton's laws here, and then you did something else and something else, okay? But the thing is, going back to the tutor, so I push an object, I keep going back like this, with a constant force, right? And I push at a distance, it's three meters or something. I must have used some of the energy I absorbed from the tea and toast, especially the toast. So we define work. Very tricky concept. And, I, and you know, guys, when I talk about being a kid, what I remember is things that would confuse me. So work is a scalar. What does that mean? It has no direction. But here's what I found weird as a kid. It could be positive or negative. So I'm pushing the crate, aren't I? So the crate's here at rest, and I know I can't, um, we're not in the classroom. So I'm pushing the, the imaginary crate with a constant force F. Just say it's a constant force. It doesn't change in time. I must be expending some of the energy from the, uh, from the tea and toast this morning. Where's that energy going? It must be making the, the crate go faster. Okay. So we have this concept, and it's very weird, and I'm not going to confuse you with some kind of deeper concepts that used to annoy my teacher. So here's the perpetual tutor pushing the object with a force F in Newton, as we've just described. Now I move the object the distance D meters. What we say is the work I've done is F times the distance. Okay. I've lost energy and the crate has gained energy. That's very important. This is the way the textbooks get around the problem of, um, of no friction and uh, no air resistance. So, and, and do you notice that comes a bit later, doesn't it, in when you're doing classical mechanics? Okay. Now, I just want to introduce one other concept called power. And power is extremely important. And I wish, I know, some, some of you may like my teaching style, some may not. Okay. Power is the rate at which I do work. So, for instance, I, I grew up an old man like me, I could be pushing the grade for a concept like this, like this, right? Okay. So I'm expending the energy from my breakfast, but I'm doing it very slowly. But if, you know, if I'm an athlete or something like that, younger, 20 years younger or something, I can push the brake very fast. Okay. So 
if I push the object from d meters, and it's the same object, the amount of time it takes to go to d meters tells me how much energy I'm expending per second. So we define power is, again, because I'm not going to work over time. That was my work. And when I was your age, I don't know, I just wish they'd just tell me the, what, what, what the variables are, what I need to know, so I can get on with the rest of my life, okay? Okay? And if you look here, it's very, very important. Just say the force is constant. So either the old man like me pushing the crate, or the athlete pushing the crate. If we both push the same crate a distance of d meters, we've expended the same work. But the point is, the crate would end up here faster with the athlete than it would with Barry, even though we've expended the same work. And that's, that's a concept of power. The force is constant. Therefore, I can define power equals force by distance over t. But force is constant, so that's force by t over t. And what's t over t? The rate of change of displacement per second, that equals force by velocity. Ah, okay. It's very important for the physics exam. And it was almost like by the time they got to this, when I was your age, I just remember the fact that I went, not another uh, unit, not another, um, okay. And we won't define it today, but energy has unit joules. Right? And work or power says has the energy. Remember, we did the 27 marks earlier on that question. Then it could also be a question good where they go define work, define energy, define power. So that would be great because you'd have your little, uh, your little cheat sheet, so to speak. Now, where does that energy go? So James Joule, in his lecture in 1841, I think, um, Quark or Cove, was that, um, see, so let's say this, this is Mr. Joule. So he's lost that energy, hasn't he? From his breakfast, his tea and toast, or coffee and toast. Where's that energy gone? The object has gained plus f by t. And he said, no matter what we do, and you learn it this all, don't you? Energy can now be created or destroyed, but it can be converted one form to another. That's fine. That's fine. But think of it like this. So the energy that's heating our planet right this moment, well, some of it's coming from the core of the planet through radioactive decay. Uh, but most of the energy that we're receiving right at this moment, and I look at the window here, is from our star, the sun, right? So energy, so the energy there is being created through um, fusion, thermonuclear fusion, basically, and that produces photons, or electromagnetic radiation, and that crosses the chasm of space and reaches us, and heats the side of our planet that we're currently at. So it's not, energy can be created or destroyed, it can change from one form to another, but also can be transported from one point to another. If there's no way to get the energy released by the thermonuclear reactions in the sun, then there'd be no point. We wouldn't be having this conversation. So, okay. so that's the last. So now, so work equals force by distance, right? Yeah. And kids like this. We live on a planet called the Earth. And we're about here, aren't we? I think we're about 52 degrees latitude. And latitude will be defined as ten angles. Huh. Not a bad thing to understand. So Ireland, Britain, France. So that's a bit error. It's about here. And the planet has a certain mass. And then, where are you standing on the planet? I remember being a kid in primary school finding this interesting. 
why do, you know, I remember one of my friends said to me, why do people not fall off the planet? He was like eight years of age or something. And I think I drew this. So, if you're sitting in an area here, yeah, as, you, as you sit in your study or your library or your kitchen listening to this lecture, we experience a force towards the center of the planet. Right. Due to the mass of the Earth itself, if you were in Buenos Aires, which is kind of like, let's say, here, the capital of Argentina, the person sitting there in Buenos Aires, hopefully nobody's listening from Buenos Aires, they also experience a force direct towards the center of the Earth. And that's true symmetrically across the planet. And that's true for any object. Okay. So, and that force, remember we talk about, I did say in my descriptive we'll talk about um, centripetal forces. We may not have time in two hours, an hour and a half. That force towards the center of the Earth. So Barry is sitting here in the lecture theater. Barry experiences the force of capital G, which is a constant, times the mass of the planet Earth, times the mass of Barry over R squared, where R is the distance between me, as I stand here, and the center of the planet in meters. Okay? And when I work out that, that will give me F equals mass of Barry times G, where G is approximately 9.5. Remember, you're not back to school yet, so just trying to kind of make sure that. So, so just say Barry decides to take, I don't know, his <laughs> applied maths textbook. Now, the textbook's not moving, my mobile phone keeps on going, I don't know why. So, just say Barry starts walking up the stairs. Okay. Aren't I, so in the direction upwards, aren't I? Aren't I move, with a certain force, aren't I moving the, the object to a certain level? So therefore, looking at my little toy model here, aren't I, I'm just going to erase that, I'm just going to be, uh, let me just get a, a wipe here. Just get rid of that. But think about Barry now on the staircase, isn't it? Or yourself. So now, against the gravitational attraction of the planet, this might sound a bit weird because you probably haven't done maths in a while. So if Barry wants to move his applied math textbook or physics textbook at distance d from the planet's surface to some, somewhere above the planet, planetary surface in meters, what force do I have to overcome? I've got to overcome the gravitational attraction of the planet. So therefore, the work I do, see, see here, so I'm moving this thing a distance d. And again, it's, it's very hard to teach this because I can't see you guys in the classroom. So I must do force by distance. Just like Mr. Jewell, many moves ago. So I need to apply, it, 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 so I'm holding the textbook like this, and then I have to say climb the stairs. So I must do force by distance. I far prefer physics all done at once, or any maths all done at once. And I'm confused, confused, confused. And then what I want people to say to me and Barry, that's how hard it gets, at least for the exam you have to take, and I go, okay, I'm in. I'll give it a go. But maybe useless of it, but at least I know what the uh, boundary conditions are. So instead of moving it from left to right here, so Barry is sitting here, and I move the object against the gravitational attraction of both myself and the object. And just say I move it a distance d upwards, then the work I do must be force by distance. <laughs> force attracting the object to the centre of the Earth that I have to overcome is the mass of the object, my textbook, my mobile phone, 
a H. So therefore, the work will be MTH. Hmm. That's where that comes from. That's where that lab comes from. Okay. And so the 1109. So when I, now, when I lift the textbook and bring it up to the next floor in the building, the object's not moving when I put it on the floor, on a table, on the next floor up. But I must have done work to overcome the gravitational attraction of the planet. Okay. So I must have done work. I must have expanded everything. And I must in some way have given that energy to the particle. And that's what we call potential energy. Yeah, that's interesting, I think. Hard. Very hard. And I'm not assuming that all of you understood what I just said. But it's time to, it's about time to start thinking again, isn't it? Okay. Right. So let's go back to the exam question. And we have this thing from James Jewell that uh, energy is conserved. So I'll go through this slowly for the last 20 minutes. So a pendulum bob of mass, let me just sit down here. A pencil, my Apple pencil. Let me see, can you see that? Yeah. So now physics is very difficult because it's very difficult to understand what they mean by these questions. So, a pendulum bob of mass 10, 10 grams. So, basically, the mass in is 10, 10 by 10 to minus 3 kilograms. Okay. Whereas raised to a height of 20 centimeters. What they're telling me here is, as far as I understand it, the center of mass of this, that would be 20, 0.2 meters. Yeah? It would have taken work to do that. So, one of the things I would have been confused by as a kid would have been you know, this conservation of energy, but obviously it was energy, energy had to be, work had to be done to actually bring the bulb to 20 centimeters above the, above the ground. <coughs> and if I'm, if I'm calculating the work I do to bring my textbook earlier up one floor, I can define what my zero potential energy is. So we'll define this here as zero joule. I know this might sound hard, especially if you haven't done physics all summer. But you kind of get used to them, and they're quite easy questions. And then, um, once I bring it to that level, guys, once I bring it to that level, I have to expend a work, okay, which would be mgh, where m is the mass, g is 9.8 meters per second squared, approximately, and the height would be 0 0.2 meters. And then I let it go, and it will swing, won't it? Right. If I can, if I can ignore air resistance, it's the only way to understand physics. Just like maths, is two problems. Where does the potential energy? It must go into kinetic energy. Okay. And see, I'm assuming once the object reaches here, that has no potential energy. So the connect so when it arrives here, again, just if you come to my class, we'll just use so many of them that when it arrives here, the kinetic energy must equal to potential energy. Assuming I can ignore air resistance. So that means a half um, v squared, and I'll go back to the board a second, because m, g, h, the m's cancel, so I get v squared equals 2 g, h, so I get v equals the square root of 2 g, h, okay. where h is 0 0.2 meters, that we had in, in blue on the left. Now here we have, an, now, now I'm going to go back to the, um, now I'm going to go back to the whiteboard, okay. Right. So, and some of you have heard me say this before. It, this is something that my teachers definitely didn't teach me. Right. Is this concept of instantaneous? It comes up in physics all the time. 
And I know some of you might be listening and came to my applied maths or my maths last year, or it's just it's just so difficult to understand. Okay. So, and I always use this analogy, so if you've heard it before, I do apologize for boring you again. So if I stand at the board and I throw my pen, I don't know if you can see it reaching its So the must be so I, I I project upwards my pen with a certain velocity, don't I? A certain rate of change of meters per second. But it must reach some point where it has no velocity upwards or downwards. So when I throw the pen in the air, very very, uh, you know, and I actually don't think many physicists uh, think about this. And I think there's something very deep about this in quantum mechanics and general relativity as well. There must be an instant What do I mean by instant time stamp? Very hard concept. And if you do apply maths, it makes everything so much easier. When pen has no velocity. Anybody, that's why the physics exam is kind of, it's kind of harder to the extent. So I throw it in the air, and you probably can't see that, if you're in class, you'd be able to, let me, I'll go down on my knees like this actually and go. So I throw the pen in the air. Isn't there a point, guys, where it's neither going up nor down? And how long does that take? Well, it takes zero seconds. There's only one instant in time when the object is neither going up nor down. I found that very difficult as a kid. So if you read this question carefully, that's what they're asking similarly. Is so the bob stopped an impact and the block subs moved along the bench. Calculate the velocity of the bob just before the collision. See, that's this concept of instantaneous. And I found, I, actually, I think of all the things I did when I was doing the Leaving Cert and first or second year doing physics at university, was this concept of instantaneous. And I had a student a couple of years ago, well, I had a few students in applied maths a couple of years ago, and they all were doing the mathematical Olympiad. And uh, so, <laughs> bright people, and I'd always get each one of them, I don't think they'd admit it to themselves, and also, I must have met when I went to the coffee shop at University College Dublin or Caltech, uh, we didn't talk about physics over coffee because that would have been geeky, right, okay? But this always bugged me, and the brightest students I have, they keep on saying, Mary, when they say, the bob just before the collision. They mean one second before the collision, half a second before the collision. No, no, what we mean here is, going back, back, go back to our um, Newton's second law, the collision occurs and the collision stops. So what we mean is the instant that the pendulum, I, I find this very difficult, and if you can get over it, it actually makes the exam a lot easier, just because you, you don't hesitate. So, so the instant, now, I don't remember anybody describing this to me. So, in other words, in this particular problem, in simplifying it, the, the bob on the pendulum hits the block. And the block, so the instant before it hits the block is the same as the time it hits the block, which is the same time that the object, the block goes to the right. Hmm. Weird, okay? So, let's just draw this now. I think that's very, if you can understand, not understand it, but I still don't fully understand it. So the block's going that way, isn't it? Oh, the, the ball is going that way. We've got our ground that we define as potential energy equal to zero. And then we've got a block. So students say, who are very good at physics will write to me and go, Harry, when they say the instant that the collision occurs, do they mean? A millisecond beforehand, one by ten to the minus twenty seconds beforehand, one by ten to the minus one hundred seconds beforehand. I said, nope, nope. 
no duration. And we'd have elevated this guy to 0 0.2 meters, hadn't we? So easy marks, get the H3 on this question, given that we, what we did earlier is the kinet, all the energy is converted from potential energy into kinetic energy. The M's cancel, so I get V squared equals 2GH, so V equals the square root of 2GH. Now in mathematics, I can have a, you know, the square root of 9 is plus or minus 3, isn't it? But because we're dealing with speeds here, or velocities, that has to be positive. Okay? So the instant before the collision occurs, it's very weird. I still find that uh, I I still think perhaps there's um there's something deep in that from a from a from a theoretical you know from a I don't sound pretentious but this instant thing is kind of weird in physics and, and people don't focus on it enough. So I'm saying it's it's the instant before the collision occurs, but the collision hasn't occurred. <coughs> so so V will equal the square root of two times 9.8, and that's what you're allowed to assume in the exam by 0.2. Let's see if I can find my calculator. <laughs> and yeah, I was hoping to do more in an hour and a half, but, uh, it's, it's, uh, but I think these are very important concepts. And also, if you get, you know, uh, a friend of mine, a very good friend of mine from New York, used to say, hey, Barry, you know, sometimes it's better to get a lucky than smart. <laughs> so maybe we could find this comes up on question six in 2021. Be one fifth of the exam. So the square root, and never trust my calculation, two by 9.8. So it's about 1.97 meters per second. So, and see, this is kind of what I was trying to do in the center. See, at each instant, the bulb is going, but it's not a tangential velocity. And what it gets here, just at that instant when, it, when the string is perpendicular, it's going in that direction. Now look, it's about 1.98. Back to the question. I know we don't have much time left. Now, now, here's where I would have found physics difficult at your age. Not difficult from the point of view of math, difficult interpreting the questions. Now, probably some of you are laughing at me at this stage. The bob stopped on impact. Ah, what does that mean? Is, going back to the board here, is now, that's a very that's that's an interesting that's an interesting sentence. So what it's saying is, all the momentum of the bob is now transferred to the block. So, so beforehand, I had my bob and my block. And that's the instant of contact. So beforehand. Bob was going at 1.98 meters per second, let's say. And the block was at zero. The instant after the collision, what we're assuming here is T is zero. The time of the collision, or the time the force and the, the two objects were in contact was zero second. That's what bugged me as a kid. It's after. What's my love about this? So we've got our bob is now at zero, and the block is going to the right to some velocity. V. See the way it's kind of like understanding the English in the past, okay? Right. We have this concept of uh, conservation of momentum. If if, if, if the net forces acting on a system are zero, then the change of momentum of the system has to be zero, doesn't it? Because force, net forces by time during which collisions occur 
equals a change of momentum. And uh, students who have come to me before will realize that I, I come quite like this analogy is, you know, uh, 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 not sure if you agree with this, but I have a heart, <laughs> okay, and it's pumping fiercely at the moment. Just like when you're sitting in front of your TV or your screen, your heart is uh, pumping extremely fast. I was making all the plasma to say, the plasmoids or whatever, or white blood cells, pumping through your veins and arteries, or arteries and veins respectively, very, very quickly. So there must be enormous internal forces inside each of our, every single living creature. I know you can't agree or disagree, but you can't, um, I don't know who's on the phone, if anybody. But they must all add up to zero, mustn't they? Because otherwise, wouldn't I be banging into the whiteboard, going that way and going that way? So they must add up to zero. So we call those internal forces. Makes sense. Otherwise, how can I stand here? If, if, you know, the wild coyote caught a, a, a circular disc in the floor below me and there was no floor beneath me, then I'd fall towards the earth like you. That would be an external force. So, what are external forces that we have? When I walk like this, away from the camera, how come I'm been able to, I'm able to ambulate this way? It's because of the friction between my shoes and the ground. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to move. So the instant, again, that the collision occurs, I assume that no external forces, at least for that zero time. So the momentum of the system before equals the momentum of the system after, whatever that means, for instant changes. So I get now the Bob's mass Bob's mass was 10 grams, right. and the um, what did I say? And the block was 8 grams. Okay. So I get momentum beforehand. Remember, the block was zero velocity. Beforehand. So I get momentum beforehand will be one by. Uh, 10, should I say, by 10 to minus 3, multiplied by 1.98. See, we're all in the right units now, aren't we? Kilograms, meters, seconds. And we're told the block, the, the, the bob comes to immediate rest. So that would be, must equal, uh, what was the block? It was uh, 8 grams. We're told the bulb comes to immediate rest. 10 to minus 3 goes, so I get 19.8 equals 8b. So the velocity, the instantaneous of velocity of the, of the block moving to the right must be 19.8. I think these are easy. But you may not have done you know, a lot of uh, this kind of stuff over the summer. And, and here, but the most important pro property here of the system, it's not that you get much, much marks with this, by the way, just to be honest with you, even the person mark you may not understand if you said it, is that I'm assuming this comes to rest instantaneously, the block starts moving instantaneously to the right, and all that takes no seconds. Right? That's weird. But it's the key to doing well. And it's almost like I do say to the student, just, just, get, just, just go with it. That would be 2.475 meters per second. And now, in the last couple of minutes. Now, here's what I would have found very difficult, guys. But once I got my head around it, then I went, ah, it's easy. And what I mean by easy, it's not that I won't make mistakes, but I just go, I'm willing to accept their nonsense. So we've had an instantaneous, so, so we've assumed we can ignore friction because the collision occurred in zero seconds instantaneously. But now they've changed the goalposts, 
now they say the block moved two meters along the bench before stopping. What was the average horizontal force exerted in the bank on the block? Okay. So this is why anybody who comes to me for applied maps, this is why this is kind of difficult. This is what would confuse me as a kid. I'd go, hang on a minute, I was able to assume conservation of momentum because I assumed no external forces, but now I've got external forces making the block come to zero. Velocity after two meters. They go, what the hell is going on? <laughs> right, I go, <laughs> didn't get the memo. <laughs> No, what we're saying is because, uh, no, maybe I'm making it too complicated, because the collision occurred in zero seconds, I was able to actually turn off friction just for those factors. Which kind of contradicts here, doesn't it? So, but, but just, it, when I was a kid, I just got used to the fact that on the physics paper, there were contradictions, and I just had to live with them, okay? So now, if you think about Newton's laws again, Quite an easy question. I, I, by the way, um, when I was your age, you'd be able to, I, I'm making this very long, but you'd be able to solve this in minutes, wouldn't you? So now we're told, so the, the bulb comes to rest, instantaneous rest, whatever that means, and the block, now the block goes from the block here, which starts at two point, if I, my calculations are correct, about 2.475 meters per second. And then after two meters, it comes to rest. Which means friction must have brought it to rest, right? Okay. We're assuming the block's mass doesn't change during the course of the movement. So, what was the kinetic energy of the particle beforehand? It would be half mv squared, as an example. And then the kinetic energy goes to zero after two meters. And then, read the question carefully to go. What was the average horizontal force? Now, because it comes to rest here, zero meters per second, does everybody agree the force must be in that direction? The friction force to slow it down. And F must equal, right? So, so the energy that it had was here. The energy goes to zero. For force by distance must equal the change in kinetic energy, which would be half was the mass of this object? It was 8 by 10 to the minus 3 by 2.475 squared. Sorry for writing on there. And the distance was 2 meters. That's the change in energy. That would be 4. Seven five squared. No, no, it's it's ugly, isn't it? To an extent. And so, therefore, that will be the, the average force will be that two by ten to the minus three. Hmm. See, remember I said to you earlier that for me it depends on you guys yourself, obviously, and I don't know again who is listening in. The hardest thing for me was to. Wait, what do they mean by instantaneous? Wait, what do they mean by, I'm able to use conservation of momentum, but now, because there are no external forces, but now I've got to deal with friction. It, it's that it, the get out of jail card for the examiners when they write these questions are the, um, are the, uh, the words, instantaneous. I know it sounds, it sounds precious, I must admit, that probably is precious, but it just made a hell of a difference for me. So 2.475 squared, and then multiply that by 2, and divide by 1,000. Now, I'm assuming I haven't screwed up. But see, the work done by the friction force must be what brings the particle to rest. If I haven't screwed up, which I might have, okay, is I might have, I get the force to be 0. Point, it sounds too low, so I probably made a calculation there. 0 0.01 newtons. That's the average force to bring the particle to rest. Now, I know I said in our descriptor we do centripetal forces. But you know, you know if the gods are kind, etc., guys, uh, that could be 20% of section B. 
And then with question five, that would be 40% of the exam. Question 12, 60%. And then the kind of wave stuff for question seven. And then maybe the particle physics or atomic physics. And uh, that's the way. Now I can't remember my leaving so clearly. All I can remember is that I, I think I've said, you know, it sounds pretentious, it's not meant to. Just sometimes exams go your way, don't they? You know, if the gods are kind. I remember applied maths exam. The only thing, the only exam result I remember from being your age was, I remember doing my pre's or my mocks. I got 100% in applied maths. What the teacher said to me, he didn't like me very much, I think, and I don't blame him, I suppose. He said, how did you do it? And I said, no, it's nothing to be good at applied maths or anything. I just solved the questions before. They were exactly the same ones that came over the last 20 years. Great. That's all. So can't you imagine, guys, we've done this question today, and if the gods are kind, maybe question six will be almost the exact same as this one today. Right. Okay. And you'll see on page one, before I leave you in peace, do you see the way I say there? That there are questions from the 1980s, 1990s, and 2000s. And what I've noticed for quite a while is huge repetition of the um, problems. Oh. Listen, enjoy, try to enjoy the rest of your time before you go back to school. And if you're going back to school next week, um, I wish you the best of luck. And, uh, uh, hopefully, maybe we'll see you for applied maths or maths or physics in the new academic term. Good morning.